Yeah, so last time we uh, stopped at discussing uh, higher types and Duden's T. So first of all, as you can see, although we are mainly interested in analyzing, as I said, non-effective proofs, so proofs based on classical logic, it is very useful to first treat indigenistic proofs and then embed classical proof systems into indigenistically approximated systems. So therefore, we will for a short moment discuss indigenism, but we will extend it to all finite types, first over just the natural numbers, <coughs> later we will have another base type for abstract, metric or norm structures, and then we form the finite function space types on top of those. And we have a lambda abstraction, which we normally uh, treat as defined in terms of these already mentioned combinators, uh, uh, P and um, S combinators of Schönfinkel, who actually in uh, 24 uh, proved this. So uh, Schönfinkel showed that the uh, P and S combinators allow to define all number terms. So basically, there is already, which is just in the curly um, paradigm, saying that the same phenomenon as at the Hilbert type axiomatization of the implicative fragment of intuitionistic logic is equivalent to the natural reduction system. And so in some sense, the curry howard uh, isomorphism was already hinted at in 24 in the seminar when children could present this uh, work. Yeah, and then we have uh, Gödel's higher type um, primitive recursive uh, operators. And the point here is uh, that we have uh, here equality in higher types, which I treat uh, uh, as always as extensionally defined. I mean, there's no discussion in Gödel. At some stage, Gödel preferred an intentional treatment and so on and so forth, but it's treated extensional. And the, so the point is, it's just ordinary primitive recursion, except that if, for example, rho is the type from numbers to numbers, at each step you define not just a number, but a whole function. And this allows one to define primitive recursively, in this sense, more functions even functions of this low type than the ordinary primitive recursive function. So the Ackermann function becomes primitive recursive then because the Ackermann function can be defined by iterating the iterator. The iterator iterates the function, so producing auto successor addition, auto addition multiplication, exponentiation, and so on. This is a type zero recursion, but then you can use on top of that a type one recursion to iterate the iterator. And then we get the Ackermann function. And uh, later, I mean, if we climb up with the times, we get more and more functions. And this is a direct correspondence to this uh, Gensen uh, hierarchy and the Hardy hierarchy, as discussed by Andreas Weinemann. Yeah, so uh, uh, you will go up to type level n, then you can define exactly the same functions, which are alpha less than omega n, because if the omega n is the n, uh, omega n plus 1 is n plus 1. Uh, uh, you know, tower of omegas and so on and so forth. Good. And then we add, uh, uh, classi if we add classical logic, then we call this pan-arithmetic in all finite types, otherwise intuitionistic arithmetic is called Heiting arithmetic in honor of Arendt Heiting and denoted by H A omega. Then there are issues uh, uh, which are very important, but I will not have discuss the time to discuss this here in, in too much detail. As you will see, in some sense, I mean, it's a bold statement, but in some sense, I think the following statement is true. There's only one principle in mathematics which does not have a computational interpretation, and that's the extensionality axiom. Because a quantitative uniform version of extensionality is uniform continuity. And so, Either you have uniform continuity, then it's easy, but if you want to treat discontinuous uh, problems, uh, then yeah, you have to have problems uh, with extensionality. And if an approach claims not to have one, it's false. Well, just give it to me and I'll show you the mistake. So that's not often what I now say. This is treated as some uh, problem or some uh, drawback of using Gödel's interpretation. No, it's because Gödel's interpretation is doing what we want to do, and any interpretation which does the same has to have that problem. 
And we will see, uh, nevertheless, that this is very useful. By the way, there's a model theoretic approach to uh, metric and norm structures called continuous model theory. And there people solve this problem. They have the same problem. They solve this by assuming that all constant symbols are uniformly continuous. And it was only recently that a person in this area, Simon Cho, a student of uh, Henry Tausner, a generalized model theory to treat discontinuous situations by basically mimicking the approach, the proof theoretic approach to, to these things. So what we have, however, is a rule of extensionality. So if you can prove things to be equal, then this will be respected. And we, an obvious model for this is the type structure of all set theoretic functionals. There are other interesting type structures of all continuous functionals. There's another one of all so-called uh, Measurable functionals in the sense of Howard and Wiesen, but let's just stick here to the to the full model. Now, as is as is one particular way to make precise the already mentioned uh, Brauer in, in Peter Dewey's talk. It was the uh, Brauer Heidegger model for interpretation mentioned to make this precise is to use Kreisel's modified realizability. It's called modified because it modifies. And Klini's original realizability, where Klini's original realizability was type-free and partial, and here we uh, uh, are total and typed. And this goes together. If you want to be total, you have to be typed and so on. And so what are we doing? Uh, so for every formula in our language, we assign a new formula asking for realizing information, so for a construction to verify A. For atomic formulas, nothing happens. For conjunction, just to you have to verify both parts. For disjunction, you have to provide a pointer. If that pointer points to A, you have to be able to produce a witness for A. If it points to B, then you have to be able to produce a witness for B. Most importantly, implication is treated as a function space. So a, a, a realizer for A implies B is a functional mapping any hypothetical realizer for A into a realizer for B. We have here tuples. The length of these tuples and the types of these objects are also you know, are uniquely determined by this definition. If we have a universal quantifier, that is a function, a witness for this, which given any object provides, if you apply this function to this object, then we get a proof that, or witness, that this in fact um, holds A of Y for an existential statement, a witness is a pair of an instance and a verifier verifying that this instance holds true. So this is uh, uh, Kreisel's modified realizability. Then let's just add the axiom of choice in, in this form. Uh, because to say that there is a choice functional here is implicit in the constructive reading of these quantifier prefix, it's expected that this axiom of choice will be extremely trivial in a jutsumistic setting, and in fact it is. And here is a simple application of the soundness of modified realizability. I mean, for this interpretation, one can show that if you can prove A, then there are closed terms in this aforementioned calculus which realize A. Now, we don't want to change the meaning of A, so we want to have the original thing, this requires some, some work, but you know, one can prove it's in my, my book, you can also specify where to prove this, but then I would need to introduce extra principles, which I avoid here. Anyhow, from proof mining perspective, what you extract has to be true, this is bad enough. I mean, now analysts or now optimization people will ask you, have you used the market principles with that advice? It isn't true. So we have the intuitionistic arithmetic in all finite types. We use full choice. We have for all exist statement. We can allow arbitrarily negated premises here, and we extract a program and uh, doing this. So this seems to be a very nice result, uh, and it's, uh, unfortunately, it only holds for intuitionistic systems. Now there is a device uh, again due to uh, Gödel to translate um, classical systems into intuitionistic ones namely the so-called uh, negative translation. In particular, using negative translation, one can show uh, that if you have a classical proof of an for all exist statement with a quantifier free matrix here, one can prove intuitionistically this statement. 
So if we now were able to pull out here, to drop here these double negations, then we could use the previous result and to get a problem extraction for classical proofs. Unfortunately, the modified realizability, the main application of theoretical application of modified realizability historically was to show that the Markov principle doesn't hold. Because you use modified realizability to show that it doesn't follow intuitionistically. In contrast to Queenie realizability, which satisfies the Markov principle in a trivial way, the Markov principle for numbers, though only, by just searching for the least solution. And since you are allowed to be partial, if you don't get a witness, then it's also fine. And if you do, then you may have found one. So now we need, therefore, a treatment uh, which um, <coughs> deals with Markov principle. Now it seems impossible first, because as I just said, either you have a Markov principle, then the, at least just for numbers' sake, then the intuitive semantics is you search for the least witness, and if it classically there is one, then you will find one, and then you are also constructively happy, and otherwise the search will uh, go on forever, and you are partial. But if you are total, and, and by the way, you don't have any complexity information using this semantics, it's just unbounded search. But here, of course, uh, you get a complexity result because the terms here have some restricted complexity. They're primitive recursive in the sense, and you can scale this even down to very weak fragments or so finds polytime. So it seems if you have such a thing where you have complexity information and you're total, uh, there's no way uh, to give meaning uh, to the Markov principle. Well, the solution is not to try to give meaning to the Markov principle, but to show that the Markov principle is actually superfluous. By making an interpretation which is so uh, 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 subtle that it already interprets negated statements like this one in a form as strong as to provide a witness for this. So when we come to use this Markov principle, we have actually already arrived at a witness for x, so we don't need to use the Markov principle anymore. So that's very important in contrast to clean realizability. We don't give a semantics to the Markov principle, which, by the way, wouldn't hold uh, for higher types because how can you search for the least functional of type of all? And, but we eliminate um, the use of this principle by making just a much harder task. We provide much more information so that the Markov principle becomes superfluous. And that's what uh, the Gödel dialectic interpretation does in a miraculous way. And again, I mean, Gödel, uh, I think, uh, most uh, striking results of Gödel uh, stem from the fact that he performed some kind of fusion foundation. So he took things from different foundational schemes uh, which people had in completely separate context considered and put them together. Like V equals L. He used the idea of predicate but in a non-predicative context. And then you get the model for uh, continuum hypothesis. Um, here, what uh, Gödel did is you take an, in, an idea from intuitionism, namely a realizability idea, but you view it from a classical point of view. Why classical? Just go back one more uh, time. If you read here this modified realizability, you see what the realizer is doing is eliminating this junction and eliminating the existential quantifier. So they don't occur here on the right hand side. The other connectors occur. Universal quantifier still occurs, it occurs, conjunction occurs. So what is left over for the verifying task is a so called existential free statement, a statement which is, does not contain this junction and not an existential quantifier. And now Gödel asks, from a classical point of view, what are existential free statements? Obviously, not not exist is not an existential free statement. Not for all not is not an existential free statement because classically it doesn't exist. So what are the statements which are truly existential free, even from a classical point of view? And these are only the purely universal ones. So you have to perform a much more uh, subtle task, namely to find a kind of realizability interpretation so that once you have found the realizer, the verifying task is classically existential free, which means it's purely universal. So you witness many more quantifiers than even universal quantifiers occurring negatively in order to achieve this. And the main clause where you do this is implication. So not only uh, uh, does 
one get a witness, you, as modified reliability, is asked for and it doesn't care for what instance you use. Dialectical interpretation also asks backwards uh, what type of um, instance of A uh, we have used uh, to do this. So, um, by the way, this implication uh, is very interesting and has close relations to a viral reducibility. It has been considered in a paper by uh, Bishop um, uh, called Mathematics as Numerical Language as the correct numerical implication, and anyhow, it's a very clever device. Now the Markov principle uh, uh, becomes, uh, becomes a triviality. The Markov principle becomes A implies A, essentially. And therefore it is solved by the identity functional, if you do this. There are other ways of dealing with uh, Markov, yeah, not the Markov principle, but the Markov rule, the so-called friedman dragalin A translation. There is a version of that uh, that has been much worked on and improved and refined in the group of uh, uh, Professor Schichtenberg in Munich. There is a way, due to Cocon and Hoffmann, to upgrade the friedman dragalin interpretation in a forcing style manner to also deal with the Markov uh, principle. But anyhow, um, I'm using here, uh, for various reasons, uh, the dialectical interpretation. So that's good around the time when he published this uh, paper in 58, but he obtained the result in 51, uh, in 41. Nobody paid attention to this. He lectured twice at it. And, uh, so it had zero impact at the time. Good, so what is now the main program extraction result? Again, we can have full axiom of choice, but now the clue is we can add in addition the Markov principle. Now, as I said, and the Markov principle to be just negative is not enough. You have to be uh, purely universal uh, at the premise, yeah, because using the Markov principle, every exist statement would be negative, because you can write it as not not exist, purely exist, but Markov, and then it's negative, and that is, is, is not allowed, obviously. And by the way, if you have the Markov principle and if you have the extensionality axiom, then you could produce already here for all exist statements. You don't have a solution, not even by functionals definable in some middle frame receptive. That was shown by Howard. So this is what I meant. Uh, so there's no solution, not even in some middle frame set theory um, of the extensionality axiom. Which is not a too big a problem because in many cases one can eliminate extensionality anyhow. So now we have the Markov principle, and we, this gives us, you know, the, this opens the door a little bit to press through classical mathematics via the negative translation. Yeah. Because now we do the negative translation and we get a program extraction result. Of course, since we have only Markov, so we can only deal with double negations in front of purely existential statements. Now this formula here has to be quantified free. And also, we need to restrict the axiom of choice, which of course classically would yield full com predicative comprehension. By the law of the student middle, we have to restrict that to quantified free axiom of choice. And now we have a classical uh, program extraction result. We don't see any trace of intuitionism here in this, but of course internally there is because we do a combination of the dialectical with negative translation. A particular um, short and concise way of doing this has been known under the name of the Schoenfield variant, but the Schoenfield variant is actually nothing else but a combination of dialectica and negative translation, though not the usual negative translations, but one which has been uh, considered by Krivin. So anyhow, this is if you are, uh, you know, if you have little time to learn what functional interpretation is, and you have only one gear decker again uh, at your disposal to write things down, then that's your interpretation. This is a complete interpretation. So Schoenfeld produces instead of exist for all for all exist, but if you make a final scholemization, then you have the exist for all version. And here is just the recipe. You see here internally this is exactly the no contact sample interpretation. So locally you do the no contact sample interpretation, but you do it in a nested way, and each time the types climb up. Yeah. 
Okay, so this is the uh, Schoenfeld's uh, interpretation, and then you have a soundness result to the effect that if A is, uh, yeah, okay, this is Schoenfeld's interpretation, if A was already in for all exist form, nothing gets changed. And then you have a soundness result which allows you to, from a proof of A, to extract a program witnessing the Schoenfeld interpretation of A. And as I mentioned, uh, this works uh, for all, for a whole variety of systems, you can go down to extremely weak systems of bounded <coughs> arithmetic. So you can, uh, uh, well, first of all, you can restrict induction to sigma one induction, then you get just ordinary primitive recursive functions. You can go to NP induction for NP problems, and that was used by Cook and Urquhart. They used the dialectic interpretation to show that then you get polytime computable witnessing functions. But you can also go to much stronger systems, to full analysis, a system which includes full second-order number theory, then you can also carry out the Gödel interpretation. This was done by Spector. You just have to add one more scheme. In addition to primitive recursion, you now have to use uh, so-called bar recursions, which is a recursion on well-found trees. Good, and as I said, in many cases, the problem with extensionality can be uh, removed, and there have been many applications of this technique. Now, let's revisit uh, things from the first lecture. So we saw, if you have a statement like a Cauchy statement, monotone convergence of monotone convergence of monotone bound sequences, so that's for all exist for all statements, to ask for the score level normal form to have a computable witness is too strong because it doesn't have, in general, take a Specker sequence, it will not have. To go to the help on normal form and ask for an counter example limitation is very weak, so weak that you can solve it, but it might not contain the com correct computational content of the visual statement. The content might have collapsed in doing this interpretation. So we need an interpretation which stays sort of in between, uh, in general, AS and a NCI, and so there's a very small corridor. And in order to, so we have to stay much closer to A. So to be weak enough so that the task is solvable, but strong enough so that we can still perform the modest ponens. Because if the A gets too weak, it will not suffice to interpret with A plus B to B any longer. And this now count this uh, combination of negative and, di and dialectica or the Schoenfeld for that matter is precisely does this. If A is for all exist, these two coincide. If A is for all exist for all, these th things coincide. But if A is already exist for all exist, it does something new. And it goes up into the types. This space uh, has only function variables. This has only uh, functional of type 2 variables. This has variables of arbitrary finite type, hence the complexity of uh, A goes up. So the point is that we stay here much closer to the original meaning of A. This is very strong, this is very weak, this is very close to A. Very close to A means this quantifier free axiom of choice, which you just saw that it's computationally empty, suffices to prove the equivalence between. Uh, a and its interpretation. That's the whole point. The scholar normal form doesn't. You need only choice for numbers, but you need it for arithmetic predicates. The Helper normal form is the same. It's only this interpretation uh, where you can show the equivalence with quantifier free choice, though in higher types. But as it happens, the higher types are not the problem. The uh, complexity of the predicate will be the problem. And so to be quantifier free, on the expense of having higher types is the right decision. Now, for applications in analysis, we are mainly considered con concerned with bounding information, extracting uniform bounds. And there's a beautiful device uh, due to Howard, namely of measurizability. So measurizability is a logical relation. So for base type, it just means greater or equal. And for a functional type, it means if you have a pair of measurizing arguments, you get measurizing results. And now you say a functional is measurized if there is an x star measurizing it. 
And now you can play with this notion. That's a very <coughs> nice notion. It's uh, completely orthogonal to other notions like continuity. You know, there are discontinuous functionals which are majorized, and there are uh, uh, continuous functionals which are not majorizable, and, and so on. So the first non-effective example is a type 2. But you get even computable functionals, beautifully computable, and therefore continuous functionals of type 3, which are not majorizable. Anyhow, uh, Howard proved that the closed terms in our system, so all the, uh, in Gödel's T, uh, all the primitive recursive functionals of finite type have their property. So they have an extremely strange and strong hereditary monotonicity property which even otherwise most beautiful computable functionals do not have. And using that property is, is one of the main tools in, in proof mining. And so I designed a special functional interpretation dealing with this situation. Further refinements of this have been considered in the context of bounded functional interpretations by Fernando Ferreira and Paolo Lieber. And so they all, all these interpretations made use in one way or the other of measurizability. Now, using measurizability, we can treat now not just proofs in number theory, but also in, in analysis, at least in a, to a certain extent. So consider this type of pattern here, of an axiom having this form. This has a trivial monotone functional interpretation, and an axiom of this form is, for instance, the binary or weak uh, Königs lemma. And so we can now add freely such axioms, in particular we Koenig's lemma, we can have a for all exist statement, and if we have here a, a bounded domain, though in higher types, so it's an uncountable but bounded domain of functionals, you get a bound here on Z which only depends on X but not on the Y. So if the type rho is just a type of number theoretic functions, this is a kind of fan rule, so you have classically a fan rule. So you have a, principle, a system where you have weak Koenig's lemma. It's classical, it's weak Koenig's lemma, and yet you have a fan rule, at least for a uh, quantifier free uh, formula here. And so this already uh, shows that you can extract <coughs> bounds which are uniform. In analysis, a bound is always as good as a witness because typically witness in analysis are you have to find a delta for an epsilon doing something. So these statements are monotone. If you make the delta smaller, if you write delta is 1 divided by k, if you make k bigger, uh, then the statement a priori holds. So in analysis, a bound is actually a weakness. So this is stronger than having a weakness, because it says you have a uniform weakness. And moreover, you can allow non-computational principles like the Koenig's lemma. And for those who know a little bit of reverse mathematics, then you will know uh, that uh, how large parts of mathematics you can actually carry out in the Koenig's uh, lemma. Like Cauchy Bearnock's system theory, Han Barnach, theory, Brauer's fixed for shoulder fixed point, Kakutani fixed point theory, continuous functional, a compact space attains its maximum, but also many results in, in algebra, Hawking Schreier theory, and so on and so forth, measure theory, and so on. Good. Now, in order to make this useful, I mean, this you cannot sell to any analyst. I mean, what is this supposed to mean here? Uh, you have to, uh, but to realize that using bare space, or here, for instance, Cantor space, you can represent uh, objects like Polish spaces or compact Polish spaces. And so you can deal with continuous functions between such objects and to analyze them. So here is a kind of, uh, let's just skip this for a moment. And, and just skip this information here. So here is an applied macro. It's the same statement as before, but now written in, in a, a mathematics-friendly language. So you have a, a definable Polish space, you have a compact Polish space. Here you need to have it purely existential, which is not a problem because you just one more existential point and it still then it gets quantifier-free. But only if you allow an existential quantifier here, you can form extensional statements. And then you want to extract a bound which only depends on the Polish space parameters, but not on the compact space parameters. And of course, as we know from computable analysis, but also from Brauer, also from Bishop, uh, that if you deal with objects in the Polish space, you deal with them by representing them, let's say, as fast Cauchy sequences of some 
elements in the compound dense space. So the, the, the value might depend on the name you choose uh, for, for, for x. Yeah? I mean, this is here the representation very briefly. So I use uh, Cauchy uh, reels and Cauchy points. So an object in a Polish space is represented as a fast uh, converging Cauchy sequence of elements in the compound dense uh, subset. Then you form this uh, equivalence relation uh, on it. And to be extensional means to respect this relation. But of course, you cannot be extensional um, always. Uh, and you have to have allow dependence on the name. Here's the most simple example for this. Consider the following embarrassingly trivial statement. Uh, for every x in the reals, there is a natural number such that n is greater than x. I mean, this is certainly provable in our system. So by what I said, there should be a, a bound, which is the same as a witness, so there should be a witness for this. And it's computable, because it's even primitive recursive. But if it's computable, then it's continuous. But if it's continuous, it has to be constant, because the only continuous functions from R to N are constant, so this cannot be. Um, so, what do you do, of course, you say, wait a moment, x is given to me as a Cauchy sequence, fast, so I take the first element of the Cauchy sequence, I know that I'm within an error, let's say, 2 to the minus n, so 2 to the minus 0, so it is error 1, uh, within my real, so I just have to add, I just make this a natural number, mm -hmm. I just add 1, and I can take this as my element. But the number you get might depend uh, by plus minus 1, on which Cauchy sequence you have chosen, whether you approximate it from above or from below. And, so and this is unavoidable. So that is um, this thing here. Good. Now, other statements. It is interesting, logicians, uh, when they encounter such results and they prove conservation. Ah, here, by the way, uh, the Koenig's lemma. In an analysis, nobody understands what the Koenig's number is, but if you say high Borel compactness, I know what you're talking about. Now, sequential compactness is more complicated, but there are special forms of sequential compactness where this also holds that you have just a minor contribution. BA means here this works for any system as weak as you want. So uh, I once designed polynomially bounded systems. If you deal with them, you can still use Han Barnard and whatever, and you get even a polynomial bound. If you use a uh, restricted form of sequential compactness, you might get only a primitive recursive form. Otherwise, it's... So, now the question is, are there any statements of this form, first of all, which are of interest? And secondly, are there any statements of this form where heine borel compactness or the Koenig's lemma is crucially used? And these mathematicians always use it in all published books. Otherwise, you might have proven the result. Uh, but, it, but it's empty because it doesn't have any instance. Interesting, many proof theorists never look at it. They prove a conservation result. Are there actually exciting instances of this? And there are. Um, uh, first of all, many for all exist statements come in forms which don't look at for all exist statements at all. Namely, they come in the form if some equation holds, then another equation holds. This is, in fact, a for all exist statement, because to be 0 means for every k you are smaller than 2 to the minus k. Here, to be equal to 0 means for all n you are smaller than 2 to the minus n. So you have here for all, you have here for all, you print x, you get for all exist. Of course, you write things with epsilon delta to make it more nice. And then uh, uh, a witness in the previous sense of the previous slide in this situation will be here we have a so-called uniqueness statement, so uh, f has at most one root in this y argument on this compact space. And what we gain from applying this result here, we first notice this is, this is for all exist. Then we get a uniform bound on the exist. But because it's monotone, it's a witness, so we actually get a functional doing this. And the functional is independent from the parameters in the compact space. This is known in analysis under the name of strong uniqueness uh, uh, result. The clue here is that this independence from y, because once you have such a file, you can now compute 
the, uh, the uh, unique root even exists. Because suppose the function actually has a root. Then you just compute, and it suffices to compute an approximate root, which you can always do constructively. It just has to be approximate with this approximation error. And then you know for sure that you are within delta of the actual root. And if you let them epsilon, I mean, you, so what you have done is for an arbitrary specified epsilon, you have found, uh, you have computed up to the error epsilon the unique actual root, rather than just having computed an approximate root. So it actually solves the existence problem. Yeah. You see the, see the, 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 the difference there? Yeah. I mean, you might have a situation where you have here an almost root, but then you have the only actual root here. And in numerical analysis, you might produce better and better approximate roots, and you are in good faith that you approximate your root, but actually you don't. Eventually you realize, oops, there wasn't any root, and you have to uh, jump here. This is, a, yeah. this is not effective. But once you have such a modulus, uh, this cannot happen. You know that you are here when you are such a good uh, person. Good, so it's a, a concept of vast importance in analysis. As I said, it can be used to construct a Cauchy sequence with fixed rate of convergence converging towards your solution. We did this, and now that, so this is uh, one point, there are interesting statements of this form, but there are also interesting non-effective proofs of statements of this form, because the usual uniqueness proofs in, in best Chebyshev um, or best uh, one approximation uh, uh, use uh, the Koenigslema, and, um, and f uh, for Chebyshev approximation, I did this many years ago in 1990, and there's also an interesting uh, development. Uh, Douglas Bridge in the 80s had a, a series of papers giving a constructive account on uh, on Chebyshev approximation. And but what is also possible to take the classical proofs and to extract uh, computational information. But here we did with Paolo Oliva, who was a PhD student at the time. We did this for L1 approximation. That's a very difficult proof. So L1 approximation means in the L1 norm, so the integral norm, so which is sometimes called approximation in the mean, and the result is due to Jackson. Jackson, by the way, was a student of Hilbert for his PhD under Hilbert in, in American mathematics. And on approximation theory, famous Jackson type theorems were in this dissertation. Um, uh, Jackson proved that for every continuous function there's a unique polynomial of degree up to n uh, which best approximates among all in this norm f. And this uh, is the rate of uh, uh, the modulus of uniqueness uh, which we extracted from this WKL based proof. And it has the optimal dependence on epsilon and omega which is a modulus of continuity of the function. So it follows from results in approximation theory that it cannot be better uh, than this. Uh, with n, with the, the dependence of n has had never been uh, uh, described, uh, described before. So this is what this does. It's a model of uniqueness uh, for this best um, L1 approximation. And again, we see, I mean, of course, it's simple exponential, but so is a polynomial of degree n if you view n as a variable. I mean, so if n is fixed, then this is a polynomial bound. So it's not primitive recursive uh, uh, in, any, in any real sense. Uh, it's of very low uh, complexity. Good. So now we come to the uh, to the main point. This is all nice and fine, but where the real application uh, played is in the context of abstract spaces. I should have noticed this already, you know many years, much earlier than I actually did, because back in my PhD thesis, I, when I discussed all these um, uniqueness results, I also discussed this trivial result here, uh, which is well known, uh, but I should have uh, taken this more into account, what's going on here. So, we have this very deep uh, uh, non-trivial uniqueness for best approximation to continuous functions, for both in the uniform norm, then it's called Chebyshev, and in the L1 norm, then it's called 
approximation in the mean. And both you need very special properties of the approximating space, namely being essentially like the polynomials. You have, you have a unique interpolation property. Now there is a and why is this so special? Because both spaces are very big. The continuous functions with the uniform norm and the continuous functions with the L1 norm both are very bad in the sense that they are not strictly convex spaces. Now, if you have, however, a strictly convex space, so a strictly convex space is one where the ball looks like this rather than looking like, like this. Yeah. It means if you have here two points, you take a midpoint, then you are away from, from the boundary. This means strictly convex. Now, if you are strictly convex, then there is a very simple uniqueness proof and for best approximations, and it works for every convex subset. It doesn't have to be any particular, any linear subspace. It doesn't have to be any polynomial system. This is a well-known result. And now you uh, might say, how to extract from this uh, models of uniqueness? Well, you can't. Well, why? Because strict convexity is a strange property. It's not in itself a uniform property. But if you make it uniform, if you go from strict convexity to uniform convexity, which is anyhow the much more useful one, then you say this distance here only depends on this distance here, but not on the location of the points, then you can actually extract. So if you make this uniform convex, then you uh, can extract a model's uniqueness. Now once you have a model of uniqueness, you can, as before, set up a Cauchy sequence of approximate solutions which will converge. And therefore, you have proven for the first time that there is a best approximation, which is not clear at all in this situation because you don't have any, any compactness here. So why, why, why would there be, there is no Koenig's lemma here to rescue, um, because if you're in an infinite dimensional space, uh, this, uh, even if C is the most beautiful unit ball or so, it will never be compact. Uh, so why should there be a point? And actually, if you look at the, um, any standard analysis textbook, basically, implicitly, you do this. You prove the existence via proving uniformly the uniqueness. And from the uniform uniqueness, you get the existence. And the bound is, I mean, this is the one which I wrote in my thesis, but it's basically in, in, in similar forms. It's, it's known, it's a, it's a half-page proof, it's a completely uh, standard. Uh, so if you have the modulus of uniqueness, so if this is epsilon, then this distance here is eta epsilon, uh, then you have this very simple expression. Now, the lesson one can learn from this, and I should have learned already back then, is there is something following interesting going on. Apparently, if you make all the assumptions you use about your proof uniform, which would be a non-strengthening if you are in a compact setting, because in a compact setting everything is uniform, you can make uniform. That's why a finite dimensional space, if it's strictly convex, is uniformly convex, because in a finite dimensional space, bounded clause both are convex. But so if you make everything uniform, then you will get a uniform result, and you can drop compactness altogether. Now you might say, but if you make already this uniform assumption, doesn't this mean something like assuming compactness? No, it does not at all. All reasonable spaces which are strictly convex are uniformly convex, but none of them, except for the finite length, will be co uh, have a compact unit board. I mean, all the LP spaces, uh, P greater than 1, are pure, uh, beautifully uniformly convex, and despite of the fact that they will never uh, uh, have compactness of the unit board, except for RM. So that is an important thing. So one can completely bypass compactness if uh, one uh, makes all the assumptions uniform. Now there is one problem to maintain this, because how did we talk about spaces in our system? We talked about them as polar spaces, so as a completion of a countable dense, uh, of a countable space. So in particular, they were by construction separable. Now, I said you make, should make all assumptions uniform, but what does it mean to make, to make the separability assumption uniform? Uniform separability is bounded compactness. This is easy to show. So the uniform version of separability means every bounded uh, subset is uh, totally bounded. Yeah, it is, yeah, it's totally bounded, which is compactness. 
So that is why you have counterexamples in all these in the previous meter frame. If you drop compactness, there are grim counterexamples to this. Uh, if you have this here, this is um, this is completely false uh, for non-compact spaces that you get such a but it's false because the spaces were nice. I mean, you thought they were nice because they are separable. Actually, Bishop went so far to say in print, one should never talk about non-separable spaces because that is a pseudo-generality. All reasonable spaces are separable. Yeah, this is very true in some sense, but it's not that it is not correct to say because all sp uh, spaces you run into on a daily basis are separable. You make this should make this an official axiom that every space is separable because by this you destroy the uniformity. Because then the proof can no longer detect whether the separability is genuinely used or it is a design feature of your uh, formal setup. Mm. And it's crucial to have a formal setup where you uh, keep faithful to the fact that you have not used separability if you haven't used. That's an important thing. That's like, like saying, uh, suppose you, in, for example, in HA omega or even in PA omega, you cannot produce any non computable function. You cannot. So let's make an axiom, all functions are computable. Why not? If you cannot anyhow produce one, why not make this an axiom? If you add this axiom, you destroy all properties of the system. You will no longer have any thermal rule, anything, everything goes, uh, gets destroyed. Okay. So that is uh, uh, very tempting to, to say, well, let's just wind it up with philosophy and make it explicit on the object level by stating this an axiom. There is nothing else than, uh, than what I'm interested in. Uh, but this changes the picture completely. So, we are not doing this. But now, if we are not doing this, we have to treat spaces not as before, we have to treat them abstract. There is nothing by which we can approximate the elements. We, want to, we don't want to talk about the elements as approximated. So, first of all, what type of statements of structures have the right uniformity? Here's a long list. Uh, matrix spaces, hyperbolic spaces, Katzenhoff, Kat Kappa, whatever. Actually, the list is much longer, but I know it's an old slide. Abstract LP and CK, CK spaces. So lots of stuff uh, are of this form. For those who know a little bit of this aforementioned uh, continuous uh, model theory or of ultra products, you will see these are the type of classes of spaces which are closed on ultra products, which are uh, treated in, in continuous logic. It's a very related uh, phenomenon. There. And again, separability is a problem because an ultra product of a, of a bar space is only separable yeah, if the unit ball is compact, which means that it's finite dimensional. It's the same phenomenon. So an ultra product can never be separable, except for the trivial case. Yeah? It's the same phenomenon. Good. So, in order to deal uh, therefore with this, we have to add them as abstract data types or as abstract types to our system. And we have to make sure that the defining axioms, by, by uniform I mean that the defining axioms have a monotone functional interpretation. So that is, for example, why when you deal with strictly convex spaces, you have to upgrade them to uniformly convex spaces. So we now do the types, uh, but we will have two base types. You can have finitely many, but I mean it suffices uh, for our purposes to have one. You then still add the full axiom of dependent choice. You get full classical analysis, but now on top of these two spaces, uh, is base types. And you add whatever you want to add to axiomatize that you have a metric or a hyperbolic or a Nantes or a Hilbert or whatever the space from that list above. Then you have the extensionality rule only that's even more serious here. You define an equality relation on the new base type. It's a defined notion. It's not quantifiable free. It's purely universal. You say two objects are the same if they have distance zero. So rather what you actually axiomatize is a pseudo-metric structure. And then you go implicitly to the quotient. So you talk about as metric structures, as quotients of pseudo-metric structures. And then you have to respect <coughs> this uh, equality relation. Now you have to upgrade measurizability. I now write it here instead of writing MAJ and write this symbol here. Now in a, in a metric setting, measurizability is a ternary relation because what does it mean to say one number is bigger than a point in the metric space? Well, uh, you have to say, to find a reference point, let's call this A, and you say uh, X is bigger than the distance Y has from this reference point. This is very 
in common with this geometric analysis you find this in Gromov's work. The Gromov product is again a terminal relation where you have an operator and you have a, a reference point. In the non-setting, the reference point will always be uh, the zero vector, so then you can uh, drop this. Now you can ask, uh, what functions from x to x are measurable? Is every function from x to x measurable? No. There are very easy examples which are not, but large classes are, for example, uniformly continuous functions always are, but also interesting classes of uh, discontinuous functions are. So as we saw already in the applications, Bauschke, the minimal displacement, and the mean ergodic theory, the functions there were all non-expensive. Not in Lipschitz 1. If you have a Lipschitz 1 function, then a measurement can be very easily constructed. You just need an upper bound um, for the displacement F does for this reference point. So how does F change the reference point? If you have an upper bound for that, let's call it B, then the function N maps to N plus B is a measurement for the non-expensive function F. This is an easy calculation. When measurizing means whenever you have an N which is measures the distance you have from your argument X has from the reference point, then the measurement measures the distance F of X has from the reference point. And if it's non-expensive, then this particular thing happens. Now you can set up a meter theorem as before. Polish basis compact, you still have that, because in mathematical practice you have a combination of both. Even if you deal with abstract spaces, you still deal with real numbers in addition. So you typically have a mixture of some parameters in concrete real spaces and other parameters in abstract spaces. So you have still your beautifully polished spaces, let's say the wheels. You have your compact thing, let's get the unit interval. But then you have a tuple of arguments <coughs> dealing with the abstract space. And these things can be, for instance, points in the space, sequences in the space, self-mappings. There are some restrictions on the types, but uh, for all practical types, uh, it's allowed here. And then what you get is you get um, a bounding information. Uh, once you prove this, uh, you get a bounding information here uh, on this uh, on this exist. It still only depends on x, not on y, but it also largely does not depend on anything from this abstract space x as long as you have measurements. Measurements. So, for example, if the space X is bounded, a bounded metric space, and it's completely trivial, the bound on the diameter is a measurement for everything. So it just depends on, on that. Yeah? Otherwise, for example, if Z is a non-expensive map from X to X, then it will depend on this B here. Yeah. And now, we, uh, yeah, this is a particular application. So if you have, for example, uh, uh, your Z is a self-map, it's non-expensive, then you get a computable bound, and it only depends here in a norm space. Um, you need an absolute bound on the z and on f of z. That's all what you need. So then you get a bound which is otherwise completely uniform, doesn't have anything to do with f. I say here computable. It's actually bar recursively computable because we have dependent choice. If you don't use dependent choice, as you never do actually in practice, then it will be primitive recursive. Since you never use full resources of arithmetic, it's typically polynomial exponential. But in general, it could be recursive. This is joint work with uh, Philip um, Gavardi. And this has uh, many applications. And maybe, um, uh, maybe uh, with this, uh, I have still uh, two minutes. Or what do you have actually? One. one minute. Two minutes. Yeah. Then let's, uh, now you have this in mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a beautiful meter theorem in mind. Uh, so let's now go to the uh, uh, example from, from the beginning of uh, last lecture to see how we can explain something here. Here, I had already mentioned this is decreasing to zero. That's why this is all existing. Now, T is non expensive, and all the, uh, uh, because all the uh, metric projections are non expensive. So we have trivial measurements for all the projections, and therefore for t. So the only thing we need is to measureize. Well, we have trivial measurements once we have a norm bound for some point in p, in c. This is here. You need this k. This is a norm bound on on points in in c. 
and you need a norm bound on the starting point. This, uh, and then you get a uniform bound which depends only on this. So, so the bound k on the on the uh, uh, elements it is actually it should be written here on the slide where k is. It's uh, unfortunate. So k is as I said it last time, and k is an upper bound on the norm of some points you can pick if you like in your convex sets. This allows you to produce measurements for these projections. To produce a measurement for x means just to have a norm bound for x. So this is all what is needed uh, to measureize. What other parameters do you have? Of course, the epsilon here from you go to zero for all epsilon. There is an n, and of course, the number of uh, ob objects here. And that's precisely what you get. And so the meter theorem I just gave explains, here applied to Hilbert spaces, explains uh, why such a finding in the proof must be possible. Straightforwardly compact, uh, constructed and probably easy, but I mean, so yes, I know that the usual proof is not constructive. Okay, and, uh, but it also, I mean, uh, whether it's possible to treat a unique existence statement in this form mm -hmm. is crucially depends on uh, that the statement, what 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 property you are unique about, which you have to, which only one element uh, can yeah. satisfy, whether this is purely universal. Because just by making a statement unique, I mean, just say any natural number, non effective, there's a number n, and then make it the least, then it's unique, but this doesn't make the statement constructive. Yeah? Because, uh, uh, so the question is whether the, the matrix is purely universal. Uh, so that's, that's very, very, uh, very uh, crucial. Yeah? And it has to be a uniqueness statement in the form here where you have a complex, but then you have some equation equals zero, which means you have here pi zero one. Uh, any more questions? So if not, let's, let's begin.